Well, good morning, church. It is great to be here with you. If you give guests with us today, like Amanda said, welcome. Welcome. We are super excited you are hanging with us today. I want to encourage you to get to the Welcome Center and get your free gift. We are stoked that you're here. I hope and I pray that you find your time with us profitable today. My name is Rich. I have the privilege to serve here as the pastor in Tunkhannock. Again, we are thankful that you are joining us. Gang, as we get going this morning, open your Bibles, if you would, uh, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 1 this morning. Ephesians 4, verse 1. If you grab the Bible on the way in, you will find it on page 800. Page 800. Ephesians 4, verse 1, page 800. As you can see by the bumper this morning, we're running into this new series with everything that we have. And the series is titled, Marked. What does it look like to have a life that's been marked by Jesus Christ? How does it change in what we do? How does it change how we live? What does it make it, what does it matter to the people around us when our lives are marked by Jesus? Because here's the thing, when I think about my life, when my life is done, when I take my last breath and I see my Lord and Savior face to face, I, I wonder what he's gonna say, what people are gonna say about my life. Are they going to say that I was living for Jesus, that my life was marked by the love of Jesus, that you can see that in my life? You know, are they going to say things like, okay, you know, Rich, man, he, he loved hot dogs. Because if that's what they, people think when it comes to me, that well, I failed. You know, when people think about my life, they're going to say, you know, Rich, man, that guy hated fruits and vegetables. Amen. Right? Because if that's what people say about me, that means my life has been a failure from what I'm called to live. And if people think of Rich and they think about, okay, yeah, that guy, yeah, he believed that cats were spawn demons. Thank you. <laughs> I know I just lost some friends, but I gained one back there. All right, so, so if people hear that and think that when it comes to me, that means my, my, my life wasn't marked by Jesus. It was marked by all these other things except for Jesus. And I want to live my life, and I want you to live your life in a way that people recognize the mark of Jesus Christ on you, in you, and through you. And I mean, that's the point of this entire series. We're going to walk through it. We're going to open up the scripture, because God makes it pretty clear. By the way, we're going to go back to the basics. This is the Bible, my friends. This is the word of God. And we're going to open it up. And we're going to have a conversation with God with it through this entire series. And we're going to talk about what it looks like for us to have a life that's been marked by Jesus. So I want you to know right up front, so you know there's no hidden agendas. I'm not going to, like, surprise you at the end. I'm going to pull our lives on the carpet. And we're going to put a light on it. Your life my life and we're going to look in the mirror and okay, okay what does it look like like because we've been marked by a lot of things in this world we have scars to prove it we have trophies that show it we've been marked by it, a lot of things people think a lot of things about us but when they think of us do they single in and think jesus that's where we're going with this series now, if you're here this morning and you're just kicking the can about Jesus and God thing, you're like, ah, I don't know why I'm here. Someone dragged me in off the street. They picked me up alongside of the road. Or I finally listened to my friends say, hey, why don't you come to church? They're like, oh, okay, I'll come to church. Like, so you're here and you don't have a relationship with God. You're trying to figure out this whole thing about Jesus. This is an amazing series for you. I'm going to encourage you to come each and every week. Because what we're going to do is we're going to get real, we're going to get authentic, we're going to get raw. But what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus, and you are going to see firsthand what it looks like. You're going to see firsthand what it looks like for you and I to have a relationship with Christ. What it looks like to birth that out in our lives, and you're going to say, okay, now I understand. And then what you're going to do is you're going to walk through the process my heart is hoping for, and what it looks like for you to live a life in Jesus. You're going to count the cost, as Scripture says. Like, what does it mean to truly follow Jesus? Jesus doesn't need any more fans, by the way. He needs followers, people who are committed to live the life of Christ for his glory. So I'm, I'm, I'm stoked that you are here if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, because you're going to hear it, and you're going to see it, and I hope that you grab a, grab a hold of it and live it for yourself. For the rest of us who say that we have a relationship with for Jesus, it might be a wake-up call. It might be a wake-up call in some areas in our lives that we need to focus in, zero in, and make some changes on. 
Now, so what does it mean to be marked? What does it mean for you and I to be marked by Jesus? So if you were to open your Bibles and look through the Old Testament and, and read through the New Testament, it would happen in the Old Testament times and in the first century church, they used a word a lot that, that represents what it means to be marked. And the word is anointed. To be anointed by God. And again, if you read through the scriptures, you see that kings were anointed by God and they were anointed by God for a purpose. And if you read through the scriptures again, you see that prophets were anointed by God and they're anointed by God for a purpose. And if you read through the scripture, you see that priests were anointed by God for a purpose. They're continuing to be read through and you find people who are anointed by God for a purpose. Even there's two guys that helped build a tabernacle back in the days of Moses that were marked by God for a purpose. To be marked, to be anointed by God, to leave a mark in this world. Now, you can find this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You can see it up on the screen, verses 21. It says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Friends, to be anointed by God simply means to be marked by God. As we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we come to the point where we realize that we're a sinner in need of a Savior. We need to give our lives to Jesus. His scripture says that we receive his Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit God comes in, resigns in our life, life change truly starts to begin. It says he implants us the Spirit. He anoints us with the Spirit. He seals with the Spirit. He gives the Spirit for a purpose. To be anointed means to be marked. But anointed is a word that we don't commonly use anymore. It's not in our language. We don't walk around and talk about being anointed. I mean, think about it. How would you feel if someone ran after you? Listen, I've been anointed by God. You'd be stepping back. Weirdo. Right? That kind of just freaks people out because we don't use that word anymore. You're looking at someone who says it acting all crazy like, I've been anointed by God. He said, yeah, you've been anointed all right. And if you come any closer, and if you invite me to come again to your church, I'm going to anoint you upside the head. How about that, pal? Right? It's not a word that we use. And it's when we use that word, people think about that word. That's what people who are far from God outside the church and think the church is a cult. By the way, if you're visiting today, we're not a cult, okay? (laughs) The church is not a cult. We don't have a special handshake. We don't have undergarments of power. You know what I mean? We're not, well, we do have a really cool tattoo. Let me just show you. I'm joking. We don't have a cool tattoo. We're not a cult. We're followers of Jesus. To be anointed means to be marked by Jesus. Simply saying that we are his. We belong to him. We love him. We follow him. And in our lives, there are some clear indicators that prove it. Not just what we say, but how we actually are living. That when people are looking into our lives, they see the marks of Christ in it, the forgiveness, the love, the mindset of Jesus. So, what defines you? Right now, when someone's looking into your life, what are they, how do they describe you? What is the first thing they think of? Is it to be Jesus? Or is it something else? Have you raised something else so much more important in your life, saying this is who I am over who you are in Jesus Christ? Do you bear the marks of Christ, the power and the forgiveness and the love and the mind of Jesus in your life? See, right now you're open up to a passage of scripture written almost 2,000 years ago by a guy named Paul. Paul's life was truly marked by Christ. But it wasn't always that way. He was a guy who hated Jesus. He hated the church. He persecuted the church. He hated all things, Jesus, friends. 
In fact, he's made it his life goal to set out to watch the church, the people in the church be persecuted. He had them arrested. He stood there and watched one be martyred to death by stones. Like, hey, take him out. He's a follower of Jesus. And so one day he came face to face with the risen Christ himself. Jesus says, what are you doing? And he realized his Savior was right there, and he had been denying him the whole time. His eyes were open up to the truth. He surrendered his life to Christ right there, right then, and he turned around and lived a radically different life. He shared the gospel with so many people. He planted churches all over the Mesopotamian area, and he wrote letters. He wrote letters to churches encouraging them to live the life they've been called to live, that was marked to live in Jesus Christ. And a truth that proclaims far more than words. So today, friends, I want to do something a little different. I want to do something a little different, radically change it up. I want to ask you to stand with me and read these verses with me. Come on, go ahead and stand. This is called Church Calisthenics. (laughs) Because here's what happens. Usually I'm here reading scripture and you're just listening. What I want to do is I want us to read the word of God together because I believe it's live and it's active. It's sharper than double-edged sword. It pierces our soul. I want it to wash over our lives for you and I to understand this morning that we and Jesus have been marked. So when you walk out these doors and you walk in the world, you know that you have been marked by Jesus to leave a mark in this world for Christ. So we're going to read these verses together. I'm going to kick us off. You just, you join in. Verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to come and lift your name on high. May we just praise it today. Father, as we walk into this and understand in our lives what it looks like to be marked by Jesus Christ, will you show us what we need to change? Will you open our eyes where we're falling short? If we say that we're a follower of Jesus, God, help us just live that out for your glory. And God, if anybody in this room who doesn't have a relationship with you, may they see the truth. That we're not a cult, we're not just some country club. That man, we believe what we say, that Jesus changes everything. And we believe that Jesus can change them too. God, I pray that you open our hearts to your truth. May you receive all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So what does it mean when we be marked by Christ? What does it mean to have our lives marked by Jesus? I think the very simple thing to start this whole thing out for you and I is understanding that being marked by God is about who you are before what you do. Being marked by Jesus is about who you are before what you do. It's always about who we are. We always come back to our identity in Jesus before we do anything for Jesus. See, Paul A couple chapters before this, he kind of fleshes it out in one verse, Ephesians 2, verse 10. He says, for we are God's handiwork, right? We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, we are created in Jesus. Step number one, who we are. We are in Jesus. Step number two, what we are called to do. It's always who you are before what you do. That's what it means to be marked by Jesus. Starts with our relationship with God. And if we get our who wrong, there's a good chance that we're going to get our do wrong. Let me say that again. If we get our who wrong, there's a really good chance we're going to get our do wrong. See, everybody in this room has been shared with some expectations about you. Someone at some point in your life told you who you're going to be. Like you're going to do these amazing things. You have this huge, that word, potential. 
And they say, it, you're, you're gifted, you're going to do some great things for God, you're going to do some amazing things in life, and you keep on going and going, and all of a sudden you have this huge expectation that you think you have to live. I need to be successful because that's what everybody thinks of me. That's what everybody thinks that I need to do. I need, that's who I need, I need. You see what I'm saying? It happens all the time. People think that you get all stressed out because we have these expectations that we need to meet for other people. And then the reverse is true. Many of you in this, in this room have been told that you're mouth to nothing. That you're not worthy. You're a screw-up. You'll never mount to anything in life. You'll never make, do anything successful. You won't graduate college. You won't graduate high school. You won't get a good job. People have been putting you down all your life, telling you who you are and basically telling you what you'll never do. See, when Jesus, that's not even close. In Jesus, there's, there's, there's expectations that we need to meet. We don't meet, them, meet the expectations of people. In Jesus, we don't have to worry about what other people are saying that we'll never accomplish. Because everything starts with our relationship with Jesus. See, our culture is a one of a mindset that we're like instant influence. Right? It means it's all about creating our own brand and promoting ourselves. That is why so many people switched to TikTok when it came out. Because Instagram changed their algorithms and he couldn't get his followers as fast. And so they switched to TikTok and you get 30,000 followers overnight. And you're like, I got 30,000 followers. I'm famous. About lifting our brand, about what we have done or can do. We made it all about that, not about who we are. That's what our society is selling us right now. And what they're doing is they're creating a society of influencers who are leading people down a hopeless road. Basing on who you are is all figured out in what you do or have done. Psh, whatever. As I read scripture, that's not even close. Let me give you an example. Tom Brady. Arguably one of the greatest quarterbacks who's ever played the football game. They dubbed him the GOAT, the greatest of all time. It took me like three weeks to figure out what that meant. Was, why do they call him a GOAT? That's kind of rude. <laughs> the greatest of all time, and I think he is one of the greatest of all time quarterbacks, came to a struggling team and went to the Super Bowl. You know, three, after three Super Bowl rings in 2005, he gave an interview to 60 Minutes that I want to share a little clip with you of what he's been searching for and I don't think he's found it yet. Watch this with me. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and, and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life is me. I thank God. It's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it. I'm 27. And what else is there for me? What's the answer? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I mean, it's, I think that's part of me trying to go out and experience other things. But there's a, I know, I love playing football and I love being the quarterback for this team. And, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find. Did you hear him? There has to be something more than this. There has to be something more. I am 27. I have three Super Bowl rings. People will say, you're at the pinnacle of life, baby. And I feel so empty inside like there's something missing. You know, this past year, Tom won his seventh Super Bowl ring. And I believe he's still searching and still empty and lost inside. A week after he won the Super Bowl, he was video, not videotaped, that's aging me. He was recorded. He was recorded stumbling drunk, walking to the parade, and he needed someone to help him walk because he's so inebriated. And he was throwing the Vince Lombardi trophy across from both the boat. Friends, he's still searching. See, someone at some point in his life told him that that accomplishment was determine who you are. And now here he has been playing for 20-some years in the NFL, and he's still lost the world couldn't be so isn't right they're wrong our identity 
is not found in what we do. It's simply found in who we are and whose we are. It starts there. And then we just to be honest, come to the honest truth. So if we want to make a difference, we've been marked to leave a mark in this world, to make a, a difference for Christ. We can't make a real difference in this world unless we've been marked by the difference maker himself. It starts, it goes back, always comes back to our marked, chosen relationship with God. Paul says we are his handiwork. Other translation says we are his masterpiece. Created, marked for a purpose. Our relationship with God is not an afterthought to what we do. It is not even close. It is the driving force of our calling. It starts with who we are in Jesus. And it's birth and the greatness from that. Not the other way around. Not the way the world says. But as God says, through his word. It's always who before do. So when you recognized that you have been marked, you've been called by God, I think the first question we start asking, who am I meant to become in Jesus? Who is that God wants me to be? That's where everything starts. Because who we are fuels what we do for the kingdom. And if we ever flip that, we'll, our, what we do will be almost insignificant because we're basing it on what other people are saying, what the world is saying, what people have told us we'll never accomplish, what people are saying that we need to accomplish. Friends, it all comes back to Jesus. Everything comes back to Jesus. Let me see if I can flesh this out. In the book of Mark, uh, there's a couple chapters, the consecutive chapters that illustrate this idea and actually takes us to our next point a little bit later. But there's two guys in, cha- in Mark chapter 10, and their guys, their guys' names are James and John. James and John. In fact, the beginning of Mark, he says these guys, James and John, their nickname is Sons of Thunder. Now, <laughs> I've always wondered, how do these guys get a nickname of Sons of Thunder? I mean, come on, that's pretty cool if you ask me. So I start pondering in my, you know, my little bean upstairs, and I start thinking, okay, so Thor is this god of thunder. Okay, maybe that's not it. Now, lion man, he's on thunder cats, uh, so maybe that's working together. And I started thinking, okay, maybe Sons of Thunder is like their MMA or WWE wrestling name. Maybe they come in and it has pommel people. I mean, that's how they got the name. I, I don't know. I'm just totally off whack here now. Anyways, these guys... These guys and their mom came to Jesus and asked him for a favor. They came to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, when everything goes down, right, and you're sitting on your throne and everything is done, it's all great and good, can we just sit next to you? Can, can I sit on one side and, and my brother sit on the other side? Can you give us a place of position? Can you, can you make us feel really, really important? Like, 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 like Jesus right here, like my buddy Jesus, right? Could you give us to that? Now, I read that, and I hear that, and I think that's really bold. And I kind of like it. I kind of like it because here is two guys who went to Jesus and asked him something absolutely crazy. Big, big ask of Jesus. Sometimes, I believe as a church, we don't come to Jesus and ask him big things. We have this small Jesus, small God mentality when it comes to life, and we're afraid to come ask him for some massive things. God, will you help us reach our entire community for Jesus? Do we pray that? Do you help us to create a revival in our own town that Jesus' name is being lifted up high in, in 100% of their homes? Do we talk to God about those things? See, we need to think about asking Jesus about big things because he's a big God and nothing's impossible for him. But the problem with these guys is their motive was wrong. Their motive was wrong. They were wanted a place of position, place of importance, and Jesus turns to them and says, look at this, in verse 43. This is how Jesus responds to the, hey, hey, can we be a place of importance? Look at this. Whoever wants to be, become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. <laughs> for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And he gave his life as a ransom for many. Okay, think about that. 
You want a place of importance of what you do. I'm going to say it's about who you are. You want to sit next to me and look all that in a bag of chips. I'm going to tell you it's about who you are in me. You are a servant. And he says, this is what I have come to do. Why don't you follow my lead? Ah. Kind of an eye-opener if you ask me. It's not about importance. It's not about a place of position. It's about who I am in Jesus. That I've been marked. And that's being lived out in my life. Fast forward to chapter 11, verse 1. They all start arriving at Jerusalem. And this is what it says in verse 1. It says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. Let me just stop right there. Jesus sent two disciples. Now, what I find is interesting is Mark didn't tell us who those two disciples are. And now, if I was Jesus, guess who I'd be sending in? Guess who would be my illustration, right? Like, listen, fellas, you want that place of position? You want the clout? You want, like, all these big things for me? You know, guess who I'm sending? Yeah, I'm sending the sons of thunder. They're going to be the illustration. They're going to be the object lesson for what's coming next. And I can only imagine what these two disciples were thinking as they were coming into Jerusalem. By the way, this is a huge day for the church. I mean, huge day for Jesus because what's happening is what the church calls the triumphal entry. The triumphal entry where where Jesus was coming in. Palm branches are being thrown down. People are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It was an amazing day because Jesus was coming in. He was going to fulfill his calling. In fact, we sang a song this morning when he was being rebuked. It's like, listen, tell your your followers to shut it. And they're like, no, no, no. If I tell them to be quiet, the rocks are going to cry out. And we sang this morning, look, we're not going to let the rocks cry out in my name. I'm going to shout for Jesus' name. This is that moment we're talking about right now. Jesus is coming in. And I can only imagine what these two disciples were thinking. Like, hey, look, this is our moment, man. We're going in. Jesus is going to give us something big. We're, and we're going to call down fire from heaven. We're going to take out the Roman Empire. I'm going to cast out some demons. This is going to be it. And I can just hear the conversation. Hey, James. Yeah, John, what's up? Do you know why he chose us, right? Right, right? Because of my leadership skills. <laughs> like, I stand tall. You know, I'm all in large in charge. I, I, next time I ask him a bold question. I can only imagine what these guys are thinking. Our experience, we, we've been with them for three years. You know, we're walking with them. It's amazing. I can only imagine what they're thinking. Here's our moment, the moment we've been waiting for. We ask for a place of prominent, prominence, a position of importance, and Jesus has given us until we read what happens next. Look at verse 2. Go to the village. This is Jesus speaking. Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter, you will find a colt there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you what you're doing, say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. Okay, wait, 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 wait a minute. What? Wait, wait, what? Jesus, you serious right now? You serious? Are we being punk, Jesus? I mean, where's the camera, guys? Come out of the rocks. I see you. This is the whole thing. is a charade. I mean, come on, Jesus. This can't be what you're calling me to do. Wait, what? You serious? You're serious. This is what you've asked me to do, Jesus, for you. I've left my home. I've left my family. I'm following you. I've given you my everything. And you're calling me to donkey duty. What? What? See what these guys were learning, friends. And it's a wide open lesson for you and I as we understand that it starts with who we are, but as we get to what we do, the size of our assignment doesn't determine the significance of the impact for the kingdom. The size of the assignment doesn't determine the significance of your impact for the kingdom. 
You know, everything in that moment, these guys were probably thinking something big. They wanted something big, but then they were put in something that just seemed so meaningless as donkey duty. He says, you have been gifted, you've been called, you've been invited, you may feel important for the moment, but listen, this is what I'm asking you to do. Will you do it? Will you live it out? As I read the scripture, I see a shepherd boy with a sling and a stone take out a giant. As I read the scripture, I see this little boy show up with his little lunchable, a fish and bread, and he fed over 5,000 people. Over and over, and I read in scripture that I see God taking minuscule moments and having the greatest impact for his glory and for the kingdom. These two disciples had no clue what they were doing. Is they're thinking like, I'm going to walk a donkey, right? They're acting like pouting, maybe, or whatever like that. They were acting that way, and maybe they didn't realize that they were bringing the cult that was going to bring Jesus into Jerusalem, that he's going to be crucified for the sins of all mankind, put in a grave, rise from the grave, and that we can have faith in him and surrender our lives to him and have a relationship back with God. Something as insignificant as bringing a donkey to Jesus set the whole scale for Jesus to do what he was actually called to do. You are chosen. You are set apart. You are called. You are marked. As we read in the beginning, to live a life worthy of the calling that we have been received. So whatever God calls you to do, you, me, we need to do it with integrity, faithfulness, passion, not because of what it is, because who called us to do it? Does that make sense? See, too often we're looking for something big. You and I are looking for something big. I, I want to do amazing things for God. I want to do this big thing in my life. We're looking for the big things. We think that's the only way we can make an impact. And God says, no, 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 no. It starts with the small things. Because the small things can make a huge impact for the kingdom. You know, I think about my life and how my brother-in-law shared the truth of Jesus with me 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. Small thing of being faithful, even when I threatened to knock his teeth out, he said, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. One small thing in a hostile environment, trust me, I was very hostile. Impact of the kingdom, not because of me, but me coming to Christ and what God has allowed me to be a part of the last 20 years. What do you think he's calling you to do? Something meaningless as donkey duty? And are you willing to do it? So it starts with who you are. Then it goes to what God's called you to do. Whatever he's called you to do. Friends, we're not going to hear one day, well done, my good and important servant. We hope to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. So we've been marked and make a mark in this world for the glory of Jesus Christ. What have you been marked to do? What have you been marked to do? If you are in Jesus, what have you been marked to do? What is God calling you to? What has he gifted you to do? What is he asking you to do? Maybe, maybe it's just gifted and marked that moment to fight for your marriage because it's failing. Maybe it's marked at the moment for a season to raise your kids to love Jesus because they're the next generation. 
Maybe it's marked to your business is to promote and, the, and Jesus being successful in that because you can point like it's all about Christ. Maybe it's marked where people come into your life who are struggling. And you're like, I don't know what to do. You lead them, you walk them, and you love them like Jesus. I had a conversation this week with someone who said, listen, Rich, I have, God's bringing these people in my life that are hurting and broken, and I have no idea that I feel so inadequate. I'm like, yes! They're like, what? I'm like, yes, it's amazing. Because that way you know it's not you. That you need to count on God, the Spirit of God residing in you, to love that person like Jesus. It's obviously that God's bringing those people to you for a reason. Let Jesus work through you to lead them to a healing spot. Maybe it's serving. Maybe it's leading. Maybe it's discipling someone in your life. Bring them along with you. It doesn't make a difference if it's something big. You just need to live out what he's called you to do. You know, today we are celebrating five amazing years of watching God change lives here in Tunkhannock. Five amazing years. Raise your hand if you want to praise God for that today. Awesome. Raise your hand if you want God to do more. Raise your hand if you think it's possible for God to do more. All right. Don't raise your hands. How many of you are serving right now to make that possible? You know, this ministry runs on people. People who live their lives on mission for Christ because we believe we have a whole community that needs to hear Jesus. We came here five years ago and it was a dark world. And we've only put a dent in the darkness that's around us. How are you stepping in and helping not us, not rich. Kingdom, Christ, God. Change that. It starts with you serving. Amazing kids ministry next door that needs people. Are you willing to rock a baby for Jesus? They don't allow me to go over anymore. I mentioned duct tape and they said, out. Worship team tech team, guest services, student ministry. Every area, every position is vital for us living out our mission. And every person who steps in and volunteers, thank you. Because God has used you in a small way to make a big kingdom impact in this community. What has God marked you to do and are you willing to step in and do it? We are marked. I am marked. Say that with me. I am marked. Say it again. I am marked. Say it again. I am marked. One more time, but loud. Come on. Now, when you think about that, and if you own it, and you recognize that you've been genuinely set apart by God, anointed with the Holy Spirit of God, chosen by God, gifted by God, God called by him to make a difference, doesn't that put a little bit more pressure in your week? Good. Because that's what God's calling you to do. Will you rise up and help us reach this entire community for Jesus? I want to pray big prayers. I want to boldly become before the throne of grace and say, God, overwhelm us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you are a mighty God. Father, we just lift this church up to you. It is your church. 
We thank you for what you've done in five years, but God, we want to get on our knees, come before you, and ask you to blow our socks off for the next five. Help us triple the people who accept Christ. Help us quadruple the people who are standing in faith saying, I'm going to get baptized. God, to help us do something in this community that we can never ask or imagine, that it only comes from you. Help us be bold. Help us be courageous. Help it be all about you. And help us align our lives to live in such a way that you can use us to make that happen. We are your church. Help us be the hands and feet and the light. Help us bring the light of Jesus in a dark community. And God, help us never, ever take an ounce of credit for ourselves. And may we always always point to you, the one true, holy, and perfect God. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen.